Yes, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the THI podcast brought to you by Tar Heel Illustrated.com. And of course, if you're watching on our YouTube channel, that's Tar Heel Illustrated. I'm THI staff writer Jacob Turner. Joining me, as he always does, our very own publisher, Andrew Jones. And Andrew, um, for people who've clicked on here, I mean, you know what we're talking about. What a difference a year makes. Some people are probably clicking on this video like, okay, what are they going to talk about in this one? And, and AJ, I think it's a fascinating, fascinating kind of conversation to have because let's go back in time. Let's put our minds back in time to about this time a year ago. Where the program was, what the vibe was around the program, reaching the national championship game up by 15 against Kansas in the national title game, and they lose. And in a lot of ways, AJ, the vibe around the program – hasn't been the same since that night, since the second half of that game. It's kind of shifted. Under the offseason, there was a lot of expectations. Number one preseason ranking, championship or bust. Let's run it back from the fans. That was not a media narrative. That was something that the players bought into and, and truly believed in. And now we're sitting here on March 24th, 2023. Carolina's not in the NCAA tournament. The Condon and IT bid. Four transfers so far. Expect there to be more. The vibe is just completely shifted, AJ. And you've been a guy that's covered sports for a long time. It's got to be fascinating from your perspective because you probably haven't necessarily ever seen a shift this dramatic in such a short space of time. I could be speaking you know, wrong right there. I'll let you hit on that in a second. But I'll just ask you this, AJ. I just end with this. What a difference a year makes. It's, it's pretty fascinating yeah. to see, isn't it? It's an emotional shift. Oh, Probably yeah. the why the wildest swing I've I've ever experienced. To know while we're recording this, it's four kids have hit the portal. Just to be clear, uh, we're recording this on Friday, and also I will say I think the vibe was great. It's the performance, like the performance up to halftime in the national championship game. You're like, wow, yeah. and then everything just kind of tumbled, and it's never over the side. In the same sense, and yeah. and they've been trying to clean that mess up ever since and they haven't been able to because the shovels suck they're really small and <laughs> i could go into a bunch of analogies that would be really silly right now but i'm not going to i think what's more important is that during last april and may and june july august hubert was the it coach in college basketball north yeah. carolina was the it program in college basketball and in a short period of time it, they became the first preseason number one to not make the field since it was expanded in 1985, expanded to 64. And they had one of the all-time underachieving seasons in college basketball history. And you're correct to point out that, well, it's not the media that put the hype on them. They were doing the run it back campaign yeah. last April. Yeah, that Remember the came videos, out. a different guy a video would come out every four or five days and they'd read something with the spotlight in the darkened gym and they were talking about run it back. So I thought it was it was wonderful when they did that. It was really cool. It was great production. It was unbelievable branding. But it's one of those things that when you do it and suddenly everything works against you, it looks kind of uh, doesn't look that great the next year. So Armando coming back was just basically, you know, Jeff Goodman tweeting it out and us getting confirmation that, that he was coming back. And then he just did a little bit of stuff on social media, which I think tells you the difference, what a difference a year makes that nobody thought he would be back. And now he is, and they're not making a big spectacle of it, which is, I think is the right thing because they need, they need to get down to business yeah. when they get the roster figured out as they, as they continue to comb through the portal, this has to be about business. It doesn't have to be about doing TV shows in the off season and traveling here and there and throw out the first pitch at Orioles games. And I'm not denigrating any of that. No, no, I no. think it was cool that Armando did all that stuff, but you know what? That's probably not a great look now. Mm -hmm. it, 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 you could sell it last year because North Carolina immediately, you see how quickly Carolina, when they're good, when the Star Heels are good, could jump right into being the, at the per, sitting on the perch of college basketball, both in perception and in reality. The, the program has that kind of draw and magnitude and, and allure. Right now, people are throwing stones at it. Mm -hmm. Not just from the outside, but also the little coterie of Carolina, emotional Carolina fans, the diehards are not happy. And now some guys are leaving that we've left the program and they think that that's a black mark when actually, I think, other than Puff being like a seventh man, they haven't really lost anything that we know of, so to speak. So what a difference a year makes. 
Mm -hmm. I mean, a year ago, I looked back a couple of weeks ago and read a lot of my stuff that I wrote throughout the NCAA tournament, particularly after the UCLA game when Caleb just went crazy in the second half, scored 28 points and watching them defend Jaime Jaquez the way that they did. Which yes. was an absolute work of art. And what a magnificent win that that was for that team. And then they take care of St. Peter's and then Duke and all the emotion and historical uh, context around that. And then even after the championship game, I wrote a piece about, you know, North Carolina cried. It's okay to cry because they've shown us they cry all the time now because Hubert's crying all the time, right? Well, we didn't see tears this year. And that locker room or those kids after they lost to Kansas, I mean, it, I've been in locker rooms with teams that lose national title, title games. The locker room technically wasn't open last year because of COVID, but the tears were there. They were distraught. They were upset. The locker room after they lost to Virginia and Greensboro, yeah, they were upset, but it was almost like, let's, this thing's done. Let's move on. So what a difference a year makes. Last year, they were on top of the world. Now they are scrambling to rebuild. Yeah. I want to take the conversation in this direction first. I've got two things I kind of want to ask you about. Um, I'll ask you this question. When you look at where Carolina was, because let's not rewrite history, guys. Roy's last two years weren't great. I think it wasn't like the program was in the final four. I mean, again, I know they won a national championship, what, six years ago, which for most programs is fantastic. You know, I mean, national championship game last year, most programs, that's amazing. But let's three not... of the last six. We haven't played this year's yet. And I... They've been in three of the last six, which is remarkable with what remarkable. you're probably about to say. Yeah, it's remarkable when you think about it. But let's not rewrite history in terms of Roy's last two years weren't great. He had a team that finished 14 and 19 the next season, COVID year, they lost, you know, got blown out in the first round of the NCAA tournament. It wasn't, it wasn't necessarily like Carolina was on top of the world and all he yeah. had to do was take the keys to the Porsche, put it in and keep the thing Hummer. It, that, that wasn't the case. So my question to you, AJ, is I think we've kind of realized now and credit to what last year's team did. Let's not take any credit away from Hubert and, and, the buttons he was able to push to get his team to make the run they did last season. They, they deserve credit for that. And that shouldn't be just forgotten about because Carolina became the first number one preseason team in the history of college basketball to, to, you know, not make the tournament and the quickest to fall out of the, the AP. Let's, let's, let's not just forget about that, but first ever lose four games in a row in a season. Yeah. We could I mean, go, we, we, we could row. rattle them off. So, but it doesn't take mm -hmm. away from what that team did because as Hubert said, and as I think Max said this before, every team each year is a completely different team. It's not the same. There's not that carryover. I think it was proven here. So my question to you is AJ, you know, Carolina's kind of had six good weeks in a lot of ways, really good weeks under Hubert and everything else has been kind of stop, start, false dawns. Oh, I think they figured it out. And yeah, maybe not. My question to you is, fans and from, should we have kind of expected a drop off? Should we have expected it wasn't going to be easy for Hubert to just come in, a guy who's never been a head coach before, and just lead him to the national championship and win it and just keep doing that every year? Should we have kind of expected and seen a drop off coming in? Because, like I said, when you look at where the program was in the two final years under Roy, it wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. So it feels like to me, Last year was more of a false dawn, and this is maybe where the program really is at when you consider just the 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 sheer level of you know uh, the sheer level and the sheer job that Hubert has to come in and take over a program from a Hall of Fame head coach and just keep it humming along. I think we all should have probably seen some kind of drop off coming in in the first place. Would you agree with that? Well, in fairness to. Uh... To Roy's 14 and 19 team. They lost Cole Anthony for seven games. Leakey mm -hmm. played point guard those games. Cole was banged up. Gosh, there was, I know it was more than seven games that he missed, but Jeremiah Francis started a couple of games at point. He was in Division Two this year. Yeah. Uh, KJ Smith started a couple of games. He started the game that they lost to Wofford. Wofford, and Carmichael. yeah. And Carmichael. Mm -hmm. yeah they, just, they just didn't have a great roster. You know, B. Rob was a ninth man before that, and was was their leading shot taker. I guess it was that year. Just wasn't a great roster. And then the following year, COVID, he had a freshman back court, and because of COVID rules, he wasn't. Roy didn't have the in person face to face time they normally would have. So that led to some of the problems that they had there. As far as what we expected from Hubert, it's no secret that Hubert didn't hadn't exactly been 
outlining practice plans for 20 years, what he would do when he became a head coach. He got the job and was kind of learning on the job, every aspect of it. But he did have a lot more experience coming back and a lot of talent. So I do think people ultimately last year kind of evened out. It wasn't a great regular season. They got blown out a bunch last year in a regular season. Yeah. They also had some personnel issues that dealt got dealt with over time, one of them being Dawson when he left. I think that was needed. That was one of those deals where, yeah, you're losing a talented guy, but man, you're gaining because he's not around anymore. Mm -hmm. There's no, no hiding that. That's an absolute. This year, the, the, the expectations were probably just too high. They were too high and we're all guilty of it. They're guilty of it first. And I'm going to remind people, and I've said this before, in October at the ACC tip-off in Charlotte, I asked Hubert, are you okay with your guys saying championship or bust? He said, yeah, I'm okay with it. I'm not going to say it, but I'm okay with them saying it. So he put the exclamation mark on it being okay to put all that stuff out there. So, it, it, But we were guilty too. I mean, honestly, I've been covering this stuff. This is my 27th year. I've seen a lot of this stuff up close. I usually have a pretty decent feel for things. And I, in turn, am guilty of overhyping and overrating this team initially, sort of ignoring the first four and a half months of last season and putting way too much into a three and a half, four week run that they made beginning with when they when they went to Cameron Indoor Stadium. And really, I think it was beginning when they went to Blacksburg, which is a few days after the home loss to Pitt. Then I think they actually changed as a team. So yeah, we're all guilty of it. There's no doubt about it. But but I do think that that's kind of what makes the next six to 12 months exciting because now the expectations are gone. Now everyone is firing their darts at Hubert. Everyone wants Hubert gone. Yeah. And people, you see, I'm fire Hubert Davis. It's not going to happen. It's not going to get fired. You don't go to the national title game and win 20 games to get fired anywhere. Mm -mm. Not Kentucky, not North Carolina. I do think year three is going to be very important because I don't think many coaches, no matter what their, what their lineage, basketball lineage is, will survive back-to-back -back years not going to the NCAA tournament at Kentucky or at North Carolina, or who knows how Duke's going to shape out the next 30 years, but that would be one of the same kind of programs as well. Kentucky and Carolina, for the most part, because uh, Kansas has had sell for a long time. So we don't really, Kansas went through some tough stretches in the seventies and eighties. So my point is, is that I think it's exciting because there is the element of the unknown. So as a journalist, I think this is great. I have no idea where my pen's going to go next year because no, I have no idea what's going to happen. Really tough, but man. It's a wonderful opportunity for Hubert to prove that he's the right guy for the job. And he's got a lot of learning to do, but he also has an opportunity to really help himself by enhancing his roster. Mm -hmm. He lost some guys that maybe none of them were going to help a lot next year. Now he's a chance to bring in some guys that can make an impact. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you right now that Armando and RJ are, way, are well behind it. Jalen's behind it. These The kids that are bought in and are sticking around understand new faces are coming. And I think they're excited about it. I think they want something fresh as well. So uh, yeah, what a difference a year makes. We could have the same podcast next year just in reverse order of when was the positive and when was the not so positive. Yeah, no doubt. One last thing I want to ask you, this is, I've talked to this with some Carolina fans off, off the record kind of thing. Do you think that I mentioned earlier, kind of where the program was at before Hubert came in there? It wasn't like, again, it, Carolina struggled in Roy's last few years for the reasons that you listed off. Now I know Hubert kind of, it's funny because what a difference a year makes. It felt like Hubert kind of, you know, he was in really good, standing with Carolina fans because of what they did, you know, the, the run they had last year. And now that's kind of completely shifted. I think the the, the money he had in the bank last year is, is gone now, for lack of a better word. Um, do you think that the patience with him is, is go and then the task that he has is, is even harder and made even harder because it, this program again, wasn't where a lot of fans thought it should be before he even took over. So it's like, okay, you know, if Carolina was, you know, in reach final fours in the last couple of years before, you know, Hubert came in, I think Carolina fans would be feeling great about it. Maybe give him a little bit more patience, a little bit more leeway to kind of figure his own thing out. It kind of feels like to me, because the program has struggled and not met fans expectations and probably the expectations that the program has set with their success over the last hundred years. Do you think his, his, his leash is a little bit tighter? Do you think that there's it's not tighter. as much? There's no doubt base? about it. I can no, tell it, you, it just seems like there's not as much patience is. with him. And that, a lot of that stuff 
doesn't really have much to do with him. You know what I mean? And, and by the way, as we're doing this right now, as we're taping this, the um, the formal announcement of RJ coming back has has just taken place. So we'll mm. we'll we'll jump off this in a minute. And I got to rush onto that. We knew that, by the way. We knew RJ was coming back. We knew Armando was coming back. If you're on our site, you would know that because we've been putting that on our intel drops on the boards for a while. So uh, we, we you got to come on there eight thirty three a month, and you guys can be a Carolina uh, insider too. Yep. So, uh, yeah, I think the seat is warm. I think the leash is very short. And I think Hubert should be aware of this. And if he has a good circle around him, people that can be honest with him about stuff, and if he's very open about it and he's not stubborn about it, then he has an opportunity to really learn a lot from this past year and move forward. There's nothing wrong with making mistakes. There's nothing wrong with maybe not being great at something. If you can learn about what those mistakes were, how to fix them and why you weren't as great as maybe you thought things were going to be. So it's, that's why this is a wonderful opportunity to me. It's a positive that Hubert has a chance to really grow as a guy who runs a program, as a head coach, as a person whose message is really messaging is really important. And I don't think it was great this year. Uh, this is an opportunity for him to improve a lot and maybe getting fresh faces in there will help that process along. I think that Carolina has a chance to remake itself in a lot of ways, but also be what it's been moving forward. But the head coach has to do a great job. He has to do a great job bringing in kids from the portal. He's got to do a great job meshing the new kids with the ones that are still there. And then he's got to do a great job coaching this team, inspiring this team, and giving messages that resonate, not messages that just becomes noise that they sort of hear, but they don't listen to. Mm -hmm. No doubt, AJ. There's we'll, a lot of a lot of this is gonna be a great this is gonna be a great next six months. Yeah, man. And we're gonna learn and this time of year from now, we're gonna know what Hubert Davis is as a head coach. So I think that's exciting too. You're probably doing another podcast like this uh for a year from from today, probably. So AJ, we're gonna run, like you said, RJ Davis news just broke. Of course, it wouldn't be a podcast if something didn't happen. We were on it. I've, I've already got the story written, by yeah, the way. I, I just you gotta did, go ahead and publish it. We, so. We've done podcasts and talked about it. We expect him to come back the whole time and it's official now. So I've been Jacob Turner, he's been Andrew Jones. Appreciate you guys watching as always. Make sure you like share, subscribe, hit that notification bell as well. And we'll see you on the next one. Thanks. Thanks.